Welcome to the Woe Podcast about horses and horsemanship. I'm John Hare, and you found the place where we talk horses. On today's show, I have Sam Shank's husband, a mind coach specializing in rider confidence. And Sam is on our Skype line all the way from Great Britain. Is that right, Sam? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm really well, thank you. It's fun talking to somebody halfway across the world. It's uh, 7 a.m. here in California. And what time is it there? It's three in the afternoon. So I've already been up to the stables today and done some groundwork with my horse. So yeah, it's been a busy day already. All right. You've had most of your day. I'm just starting mine. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming on the show. And you've been working with people to help build their confidence. Before we get into that, Sam, how about telling me a little bit about your horse and equestrian background? Well, it all began about six years ago. I came back to horsemanship uh, as an adult, having you know stopped to have my son. And before I came back, I'd been reading some Mark Rashid books, so I was expecting everything to be really different. And I went to all the local riding schools, and what I found was I was being taught the same old stuff that I'd been taught 30 years earlier. And the thing was now, I, I knew that to be wrong. It's uh, in the UK, the military style of riding is still very popular. Um, and it was, you know, elbows in, heels down, tighten your rein. And it just didn't sit well with me. I knew it. I knew that there were people riding in a very different way. And that's when I found a natural classical horsemanship trainer called Philippa Unwin, who has a yard called Pip's Way of Natural Horsemanship. So I went to see Pip and my first lesson was so different. We spent two hours mostly talking and then we went into a stable with one of her horses and at Pip's Way, the, the doors always kept open no use of head collars, etc. Uh, not not at this juncture, anyway. Uh, I'm and, sorry. No no use of what was that? Um, we didn't use a head collar or anything. We just entered the stable. The door stayed open. She showed me how to ask the horse to stand in a particular place, and and groom, with no use of lead ropes, head collars, and I've just never experienced anything like it. And that's when I thought, yes. I found somebody here who truly understands horses, horsemanship, and just working with horses in a completely different way. And I went on to do nine months of groundwork. And before I met Pip, I'd never understood the importance of groundwork and how this builds the partnership with our horse and how all that groundwork then leads to, you know, a great riding partnership. And the other thing that uh, Pip taught me, which I'd never experienced before, was how if we want to change anything in ourselves, uh, in our horse rather, then we have to change ourselves. And that means, you know, our awareness of our thinking, our emotions, you know, our energy, our physical body language, even our intentions, our expectations our environment, and how all these things affect us and our horse. So it was a huge eye-opener. It's been life-changing, actually. So when did you get back into horses? So it was about six years ago. How long did it take you to come to this realization? Well, I knew there was a huge change from the very first lesson, to be fair. Mm -hmm. And then over over the coming nine months with the groundwork, I mean, it was just, every, I've actually written a blog on her website about my experiences because they were so profound. It was such a different way of being with horses. And actually, if I was to try and capture it for you, John, I would say when I was a child, I ha you know, I used to read pony books and um, you have this dream of how you're going to be with horses or with your pony and what I've learned through Pip is actually how to be with horses in that way. I, I'm having that experience now. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's a constant path of self-improvement. What I've learned about horsemanship is it's actually, it's incredibly difficult. You know, there's so much going on. You're spinning so many plates all at the same time. And in a world where we're constantly being dumbed down. You know, everything's done for us automatically now. I mean, I don't know about you, but in my car, I don't even have to turn on the headlights. Mm -hmm. I don't have to turn on the window wipers. Everything's automatic. So 
really bringing our focus and awareness into the moment and having that 360 degree awareness of ourselves, our horse, our environment, and and also the effect of what we're doing on on this, you know, those around us. It's it, it's a discipline I think we've lost. Certainly, it's one that I had lost, but I absolutely love it. It's it's been one of my greatest joys in my life, learning this way of being with horses. I'm a big fan of groundwork as well to build that relationship with your your horse, and it's really a practice in observation because you you can observe the horse so much better on the ground. You can watch his ears, you can watch his lips licking, you can watch the way he breathes or swishes his tail. And for a lot of times when you're riding, when you're under saddle, you've got the it's the effect of trying to steer that animal around. And you might not, be, you have to be looking around at your surroundings and you might not be able to be as aware of what the horse is feeling while you're under saddle. So I really like that groundwork concept too. Yeah, I mean, this morning I've been doing some groundwork with my horse and the, the thing that I love about it, I completely agree with everything that you said, John. And I think what's so important is recognizing that if we can introduce ourselves to everything that we need to be doing and the horse to everything that the horse needs to be doing without bringing the aspect of riding in, as you say, it frees up a lot of space to focus on the things that we need to. And Pip was teaching me how to communicate with horses in the way they naturally understand using my energy, intention and body language. And learning to work with those aspects of myself before bringing in, like you say, the moment you bring in riding, there's so much more that comes into it. It really is helpful for both the horse and the human to master those aspects first. And this is where a lot of my work comes in before the person even gets to the horse, you know, learning to work with certain aspects of themselves. So having now experienced this way of being with horses, I mean, I've, I've had my horse for over a year and I haven't ridden her yet because we've been doing lead work, going out for walks around the lanes. I say walks. I mean, we walk, you know, as fast as I can physically walk and we're learning road craft, decision making. Um, she's being exposed to all the demands that will be made of her when she's ridden out but she's experiencing that without the demand of, of me, her rider, and any mistakes that I may be making. And like you say, it frees up my attention and awareness. And just yesterday, we went out for a really long walk, and my trainer took us along a slightly busier road than usual, deliberately. Um, we're ready for that, just to introduce her to the busier traffic. And being in that different situation, I started thinking backwards and I didn't realize that I was doing that. And it was only when she called me out and said, you've slowed right down with your walking. Your, your focus is far too much backwards. You know, you need to get back up to speed, get your focus forwards again. And we were off. And learning that, making those mistakes on the ground really sets us up for success for when, when we come to the ridden work. And a lot of people don't understand why I'm not riding my horse yet, but knowing how that groundwork leads to the great riding partnership and the trust that we're creating and the bond and the communication. I mean, I, in, in essence, I am riding her. I'm riding her from the ground. I'm using my posture, my energy, my intention, you know, my breathing, all of those things. So, I, I just absolutely love it. I'm really looking forward to riding her. We're hoping to back her later this year. Oh, very good. Very Putting good. that time in now, I know that's really going to pay off later. When you got back into horses, you had a, a horse that you rode on a regular basis? Yes. So when I first went to Pip's Way, she had a horse called Bronson that had recently come to her yard. He was a rehabilitation case. Um, he'd lost an eye in an accident. And I did nine months of groundwork with Bronson. And the first time I rode him, it was such a joy. I, I felt like an eight-year-old again. It was, I had a such a sense of lightheartedness and joyfulness that I just hadn't, hadn't felt for a very long time. It was wonderful. And 
Bronson and I were having a great time. And it's actually this horse that brought me to becoming a mind coach because I ran into some difficulties in my personal life. And whatever effect that had upon me and my state, I went to ride him one day and he just basically said, no, thank you. And he bucked. Now, he didn't buck to get me off. I didn't come off. Um, he was just letting me know that he wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. So I dismounted. Um, Pip arrived at the yard and I explained what had happened. And it was it was crazy, really, John, because it doesn't sound like much. But for some reason, I completely lost all my confidence and I was afraid to ride. Um, and it got to the point where he some horses cope better than others with a nervous rider, as we all know. And this particular horse, I think because of his background, because he was a rehabilitation horse, he just couldn't cope with it at all. And actually with him, a nervous rider could be very dangerous. So I'd reached a point where it was a case of I either needed to sort my head out or I wouldn't be able to work with this horse. So I found this stunt company in Hemel, Hemel, Hempstead that run rider confidence courses, went along and I realised how I'd been shaping my experience. So completely outside of my conscious awareness, even the night before going to the yard, I was imagining him rearing and me pulling us over backwards. I was imagining him bucking, me falling off, you know, just imagining all these worst case scenarios. I hadn't even been aware that I was doing that, John. You know, that was completely outside of my awareness. The only thing that I was aware of was that I felt afraid to ride. So, And, and just to put a point on it, the horse had done nothing like that to set it, set it up. It was your mind starting to run away with things. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So... Having gone on the course, recognised how I was basically doing this to myself, Bronson and I went on to enjoy a wonderful relationship together. He's retired now, but we had such fantastic times. He never bucked again with me. And having been through that experience of completely losing my confidence and then finding it again and just going from strength to strength in my relationship with this horse, that's what inspired me to go and do my training and enable me to help other riders who are struggling with their confidence because I don't know if it's the case where you are John but over here there in, in with many riders there's just a complete lack of awareness of how how they are has an effect on their horse so for example not recognizing that if the horse doesn't want to be caught it might just be that your energy's wrong that you're not in good shape and the, so the horse doesn't want to be with you. Mm -hmm. And by doing a quite a simple breathing exercise or a grounding and centering exercise and just finding that calm, that inner stillness and changing your state, then the horse might then be very happy to come with you. But there's a real, unfortunately, a, a real lack of awareness, certainly with the people that I work with. So teaching them how they can manage their state, how they can raise their awareness of themselves, what's going on in their minds, how they're using their minds, how they're using their even their breath. It can be transformative. And one of my clients recently, her horse was rearing and spinning. And just after her first session where she learned how to breathe properly, she came back from a ride and she just couldn't believe it. She said he wasn't rearing, he wasn't spinning, he wasn't shying, he wasn't spooking. And that was all because she was breathing properly, she was calmer, she, you know, and, and obviously that has a huge impact on the horse. It does. I remember when I, I was testing out the horse that I have now is probably, uh, what well, had to be 17 years ago, Jesse. I was over at their current owner's house and I was getting ready to use the round pen, only her granddaughter was in the round pen riding a pony. And... So I was watching her ride and the pony, she was just kind of whacking on this horse, kicking it to try and get it to go. And I looked at the 
to grandmother and I said, what's going on here? And she goes, she wants that pony to lope, but the pony knows that she's not ready to lope. I think mm. the, the girl was like six or seven or something like that. And the pony wasn't going to do it. She says, I, you know, another experienced kid could get on that horse and the horse would sense that the, the child was ready to to canter around the the round pen and would do it for it, but that not not with this kid on on his back. So, I think you're right. I think it's the way we interact with horses is really important. And a lot of us that have come back to horses have come back at a much older age, and we don't bounce as well as we <laughs> used to. And so we do. We get that little tension in our bodies. That which is a natural thing for us to kind of protect ourselves, but that tension transmits in our legs, in our hand. You know, we may have uh, excess contact in the horse's mouth. We might be telling the horse, checking in constantly, uh, how how you doing, how how are we going, how are we doing, and the horse is like, hey, what are, is there something we're supposed to be nervous about? And and they start, well, maybe there is something scary behind that bush. Yeah, absolutely. You can't see me, John, but I'm nodding away here <laughs> in total agreement. Yes, absolutely. So the very first thing I generally teach riders is about their nervous system and the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So the fight and flight response and the rest and digest response and how we can deliberately activate our rest and digest and how we can avoid activating our fight or flight because the thing is even with our breathing for example if we're if we're chest breathing which I tend to find with riders well actually not just riders most people generally most people chest breathe and also riders quite often hold their breath I find that particularly with competition riders or certainly my competitive riders are more aware of the fact that they're doing that right and that immediately activates our fight or flight and then that's telling our horse there's something to worry about here and they're going to believe us. <laughs> so <laughs> it's so uh, it's so counterproductive. But as with all things, if people have never been taught how to breathe properly, if they've never been taught about how their state is affecting their horse, if they're not aware of how they're using their mind, and even if they are aware but then don't know how to change it, it's easily resolved by by learning and developing these new skills. And I think accepting that horsemanship is difficult. And as you say, coming back to riding, I mean, I, one of my clients, Elizabeth, who's given me permission to, um, to speak about her, she came back to riding in her 60s and she'd been a very competitive rider in her youth and done really well in show jumping. And she was so frustrated coming back to riding in her 60s and finding, you know, she wasn't able to do now what she was able to achieve then. And she found that her inner dialogue, her self-talk was appalling, which, of course, was only then serving to make things worse. Because, as you say, our bodies then respond to our, our thoughts and our breathing it makes us tense, which makes it harder for the horse to move correctly beneath us. Mm -hmm. And... Thankfully, through our work, we were able to transform her in a dialogue. So not only was she able to enjoy the show jumping once again, she recently won her class at the World Equestrian Centre in Ocala. Wow. And she, yeah, she's 65 and there were 62 other riders in her class. So, oh, my gosh. Yeah, she was delighted. And it just makes my day, you know, it absolutely makes my day when... I'm able to work with people and help them to transform their experience of themselves and then themselves with their horse, because the knock on effects are profound. Let's talk about some of the practical things that people can do. So I've seen friends and, and fellow riders that have come off their horse and when they get back on, they're extremely tense and and you know you try to tell them to breathe you try to tell them to calm down and it's a very difficult chore at, for them mm. and as an observer and it's happened to me too by the way but as an observer you you say you know that 
it's not going to get better until this person relaxes. But right then, they don't have the ability to relax. Do you have any recommendations about what someone going through that process, where they start? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, telling people to breathe. And I often meet people who say to me, well, I'm doing breathing exercises. But if you're not abdominal breathing, those breathing exercises won't be helping you. If you're chest breathing into your chest. So the first thing I tend to invite people to do is put a hand on their belly, a hand on their chest, just close their eyes and breathe for a few moments and notice which hand moves more, the hand on their belly or the hand on their chest. Most of the time, people are breathing into their chest. So just teaching people to breathe in through their nose because that releases nitric oxide, which aids our oxygen absorption. It does lots of other wonderful things as well, but you know that's enough for, for now. Um, breathing deep into their abdomen and making their out breath longer than their in-breath because it's the out-breath that's activating the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest. If your fight and flight was the accelerator, your parasympathetic nervous system is the break. The best way to influence our state in the moment is with our breathing. So if we're breathing deep into our belly, breathing in through our nose, making the out-breath longer than the in-breath, that will be beneficial. The other thing I would say, um, I encourage all my clients to use guided visualization. And it was a horse that taught me the difference between imagining things and guided visualization. So Pip had a horse that had come to her. He was so dangerous. Again, Pip gets lots of horses for rehabilitation. And she had been working with him for a time. One of his big issues was napping, so he didn't want to hack out on his own mm -hmm. and would engage in really extreme behaviours to um, get out of having to do that. So she'd reached a point with him where, you know, she she said, right, I want you to take him out. I mean, I, I, presumably she had taken him out. She asked me to take him out on a hack on his own. And the thing was, I knew she would never ask me to do it if I wasn't capable. Pip always sets people up for success. But by the same token, I knew that if I made a bad job of it, not only would I have a horrible experience, but also she would be upset with me because that would mean I was bringing her horse backwards. So I'd have been undoing all her good work. So I noticed that I was feeling feeling quite nervous about it. I noticed that I, I was thinking about it and imagining it going wrong. So I thought, right, I need to do some mental rehearsal here. So I started imagining being at the mounting block, getting on, riding off the yard. And I saw this over and over again in my mind, but I realised that I just wasn't believing it, John. You know, I was imagining mm -hmm. it, but I, I wasn't believing it. So I thought, right, what would it feel like to have complete belief, absolute certainty, total trust in myself and my ability and complete trust in the horse? What would that feel like? So I, I created those feelings and just amplified them and amplified them until I was just full of certainty, trust and belief. And I just kept running through, kept imagining, but with this belief and expectancy. And when I went to the yard the next day, <laughs> I, I'm sure I could have launched a rocket off the yard. <laughs> <laughs> I was so certain and Absolutely. We, we rode off the yard and went and did our hack and it, it was it was perfect. So when we're riding, we really want to be imagining what we want. One of the things that riders often do is they imagine what they're afraid of. And, and obviously, that's what I used to do myself and what I was doing when I was thinking about riding Centurion that day. So really using our minds to work for us instead of against us. And with classical horsemanship, one of the things you do is you picture in your mind what you want to have happen. And there's a couple of reasons for that, one of which is the idiomotor response, which is where when we think something in our mind, it creates these tiny responses in our body. And of course, a horse is sensitive enough to react to those. Mm -hmm. So 
We're imagining what we want. We're picturing what we want to have happen. We're using our posture, our breathing, you know, having our focus and awareness on what we want. And all those things help. Now, if somebody's had a fall, then I guess it depends why have they fallen. If they've fallen because the horse is reared or bucked, then I'd say, well, we've got some things to look at there. It's not a case of just doing some breathing exercises and using your imagination and hopping back on because why has that happened? Right. What was going on? If it's that somebody, you know, was going up to a fence and they weren't sufficiently focused and they, you know, they were imagining the horse not doing it, then, you know, that's one thing. But it could be there's something else going on. So when someone has come off, it's exploring, you know, why has that occurred? Is it appropriate just to get straight back on? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But certainly learning to manage your state away from your horse and really developing those skills means that when you need them in situations like that, so if the horse is spooked and you've just lost your balance and come off and you want to get back on, you have that control you're able to manage your state but these are skills that we need to learn and develop so that when we need them in the moment we can call upon them and they're best developed away from the horse as with many things because as we were saying about the groundwork if you're trying to do all these things while you're with your horse there's so much going on mastering these aspects of yourself away from your horse then means you can really use those skills whilst you're with your horse. Right. And I think that you make a very good point in saying that all this is predicated on a knowledge of horsemanship. It's assuming you have the skills to be a good rider. And I think a lot of people who come to riding back to horses late in life, they think that riding was the same as it was 30 years ago when they were, you know, when they were 12 or 14. And you mentioned there have been a lot of things in horsemanship that have changed and the philosophy has changed, but it's also the horses are much better and you have to have a certain level of skill to handle those horses. And I think that part of building confidence is learning more about horsemanship and how to communicate properly with your horse. That also gives you confidence when you're when you're under saddle. Absolutely. I mean, it's interesting you say that things have changed because the the knowledge of horsemanship that we think of as being new and different. I mean, it's been around for thousands of years. When you think about the monks that used horses to find enlightenment when they reached a certain level in their training, they would be given a horse, a wild horse, and they would have to become who they needed to be for that horse to want to be with them. And that's thousands of years ago. What What's wonderful is that more people are embracing that way of being with horses. Absolutely, I completely agree with you. So I'm working with riders on their mindset, but it's only one part. It's only one aspect of horsemanship. Now, I think it's a really important part. If you're going and you're learning all the things to do with your body and you're not being taught how to use your mind, then you're missing an important part. So it's bringing all those things together. And I don't teach horsemanship, obviously. Everything I know about horsemanship, I've learned from Philippa Runwin. And I do have clients where it's clear that they need extra help. And I will point them Pip's way and say, look, you know, get in touch with Pip and she'll be able to help you because I don't profess to have that knowledge. I'm very clear about where my skill set lies, what's within my remit. You know, the the other thing we have to consider, John, is, is the environment. You know, how a horse is being kept. Are they with a herd? Are they out 365 days a year? Are they stabled 24 seven? As you know, there are so many aspects to horsemanship. And to my mind, great horsemanship is learning to play the instrument of yourself, learning how to change yourself, to work with your thinking, your emotions, your energy, your body, your intention, your expectation, all those things. But you're absolutely right. A knowledge of horsemanship and also keeping your horse in an environment where he can 
flourish and thrive, they're all essential aspects to have a really successful partnership. Tell me about the process of you working with people. Say there's somebody in the United States. You're in England, so well, how, does, how does that work? I run all my sessions online. I always mm-hmm. have. So even when I work with people in the UK, I still run all my sessions online. And the reason I do that is because it's so easy for people. They don't have to travel anywhere. They don't have to worry about parking. They can see me at the time of their choosing from anywhere in the world in the comfort of their own home or anywhere they've got an internet connection. So it just makes it really easy, really accessible. And I work with riders one-to-one. And I also run my Confident Rider course for small groups. And the Confident Rider course is quite intense. It's run over four weeks. And the group dynamic can actually be really beneficial. Evidence shows that we tend to make more progress when we're in a group. And I find Hmm. that many of my riders, they love realising that they're not alone in their experience. I think so many of us feel like we're the only ones that are having an experience. And Being around people who are having similar challenges and seeing them overcoming them and supporting each other, it just can be a wonderful dynamic. I also work one-to-one with riders. Some people really want that one-to-one attention. And if I'm working with a competitive rider, for example, the Confident Rider course is suitable whether you're a happy hacker or an eventer it's still suitable because each of the exercises, each of the tools and skills, you can apply to your own situation. But working one-to-one with riders, then we're creating sessions that are bespoke for them and their needs. So those are the ways that I work with people. People can book a call with me through my website. They, they book their sessions with me through my website. So the customer journey is really simple. It's really smooth. And when I work one-to-one with riders, they fill out an assessment form. So I capture exactly what their goals are, what their current challenges are. Through all that information, I'm then able to, as I say, create sessions that are bespoke for them. With a Confident Rider course, it, it follows a format. But that format has been informed by my work with one-to-one riders and finding mm-hmm. that these really common themes, these overarching themes where You tend to find, I tend to find, that riders experience a lot of the same challenges. And one of the things is, as we spoke about earlier, is people's breathing. That really is the first thing we we look at because it's such, our breath has such an effect on our horses. And riding with the breath is such a wonderful, powerful thing to do. But most people I meet have absolutely no awareness of how they're breathing. Um, Right. And also how they can use their breath. So that's usually the first thing we look at. Another thing, um, a very common theme, is is people imagining what they fear. You know, when we're riding, we need to imagine what we want to have happen, which, as I said earlier, has got those two effects. Firstly, the idiomotor response and those tiny physical responses in our body, which a horse can pick up on. And also, when we're focused on what we want to have happen, there's there's just no room left for all the what ifs and worst case scenarios. And we can be calm and committed to what we're doing in that moment. And this is one of the really important things that I teach, John, is the fact that, as, as I've said many times now, horsemanship is difficult. Good horsemanship is difficult. There's so much going on. And if you've got feelings of anxiety and nervousness or you're imagining worst case scenarios, something really important has fallen off the plate because there simply is not enough room in our minds to be focusing on all the things that we need to be, our posture, our breathing, what we're asking of our horse, where we're going, our pace, direction, speed, you know, what's going on in our environment. There's so much to be thinking about. When you're focused on all the things that you need to be focusing upon, there's simply no room for fear and anxiety. There's no space for it. So that's a really important reason to help people to get their minds working for them instead of against them. And that takes that takes practice, and sometimes guided practice is the best way to go with that. Yeah, absolutely. And what I, what horsemanship has taught me is that 
good horsemanship is actually a way of life. We can't expect to live one way and then be with our horse and suddenly turn into this person who's got great posture and is really present and aware. And really it's by developing our mindfulness and our awareness and our focus in every moment of our lives. I mean, if, even if we consider our relationships, how we listen, how we listen to our friends or our children or our partner, our work colleagues, active listening. It's a wonderful skill to have, which mm -hmm. if you've learned that and developed it and you bring that to your horsemanship, I mean, it's going to improve every relationship you have. Developing these skills away from the horse, practicing them in your everyday life. Many of my riders say that they just feel happier. They enjoy their lives more. I've been doing the podcast for 10 years now, and it's amazing how often I hear that when people really start connecting with their horses on a higher level, it transcends the rest of their life too. Their, with their relationship with friends, family, and society in general. Absolutely. I mean, what I've learned from Pip is that when we become everything we need to be, to be who our horses need us to be, we truly do become the very best version of ourselves. And of course, knowing all these things and doing these things, they're not one and the same. They're all no, skills. that's true. <laughs> they're all skills that we, we learn and develop. And we're all works in progress. And we always will be. One of the things Pip said to me at one stage of my journey was, you're never going to get there because horsemanship's like the universe. There's no end to it. There's always more. There's always further to go. And obviously, for some people, they want to reach a certain level of horsemanship and, and they're content with that. And that's absolutely fine. For myself, I really want to become the best horsewoman that I can be insofar as in my connection with my horse. I, I personally am not worried about competing or doing dressage. For, although I will be doing dressage just through my riding. I mean, it's it's a lovely thing, actually, hacking out with Pip. You'll often see her doing things like PF around the lanes. <laughs> 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 because we ride with the same expectation of ourselves and our horses, whether we're hacking out, or we're on the Quantox, or we're going around the Canterfields, as we do in the menage. There's no separation. The level that we're asking of ourselves and our horses is the same all of the time. So... It's this never-ending journey, this constant path of self-improvement. And I absolutely love it, John. It, like, as I say, it's been one of the deepest joys of my life. And I love my work. I love working with equestrians and riders and helping them to help themselves to have a better experience of themselves and their horsemanship. And then once they've learned those skills, they can be more present with their trainer. Very often, if we're if we're nervous or we're anxious, it's really difficult to take on new information or even have the awareness of what we're doing with our body or our mind. So by developing those skills, we really can improve our horsemanship, both by simply being in a better state, which is easier for our horse, by being more physically calm, which, as you said earlier, if we're tense and we're gripping and we're restricting, you know, that's going to have very negative effects. So by being able to be calmer and more present and more aware, we can improve our horsemanship on every level across the board. Well, I think you're absolutely right. And this has been great fun, Sam. Um, if people want to find out more about the programs that you offer, where can we send them? So the best way to find me is go to my website, which is preparetowin.co.uk. Um, there's a page dedicated to rider confidence. There's all the links there for people to book a call with me, jump on one of my courses, book a mental training program with me. So it's all very easy to access. People can email me at sam at preparetowin.co.uk. They can message me via Facebook. I've got a Prepare to Win page on Facebook. And I really enjoy meeting people and chatting with them and discussing their needs and deciding if I'm the right person to help them. So I'm always open to jumping online. People can book an online call with me through the website so that they can meet me, ask any questions that they have, um, discuss the ways in which I think I can help them. And then we can decide together if 
if I'm the right person for them and they'd like to work with me. That sounds great. Building writer confidence is really a challenge. Once you've lost it, it's really hard to get it back. And I think what the work that you're doing, helping people, is very important. Thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your experiences. Oh, you're very welcome, John. Thank you so much for having me. And the last thing I'd like to say is, just in response to your final comment there, some of the ladies that have come and worked with me thought they were going to have to give up horsemanship. They thought they were going to have to sell their horses because they were so nervous, so anxious, and had completely lost the joy in riding. And helping people to find that again, to overcome their anxiety, their overwhelm, their stress, and teaching them how to use their body, how to use their minds, and helping them really develop those skills. And then hearing about how that's changed their experience of themselves and their horsemanship, just such a privilege. I absolutely love the work that I get to do. And thank you so much for having me today. It's been lovely. It's been my pleasure. That'll do it for this episode. You wouldn't think it, but confidence can sometimes be such a fragile thing. It's important to protect it as much as we can. Once it's lost, it can be difficult to find again. Thanks to Samantha Shanks' husbands for sharing her approach to regaining confidence lost. Many of her techniques could benefit every rider. Check out her Prepare to Win website and contact information. I'll have her web address, contact, and other links in the description at woepodcast.com. It's a lovely May here in the Central Valley of California. We're lucky to spend many hours in the saddle once again. I hope you're doing the same. As always, if you'd like to share a story or experience about your horse or suggest a guest, let's hear it. Send an email to john at woepodcast.com or connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram under the name Woe Podcast. I love hearing from you guys. Thanks again for listening and sharing the podcast with your friends and riding buddies. Until next time, for Renee, this is John Hare saying, go have some fun with your horses. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.